Also very proud to say so. Uh, he was my advisor, but also he is America's historian. Okay? He is our historian. He, if you've seen that giant book, 40 Years in America, True Parents, 40 Years in America, that's his great work. Okay? It's one of his great works. And, uh, he just, of true parents through this in, in 40 years of life in, in America, sacrificing in America. It's amazing uh, work. And he's continuing to do so. The same type of thing. He, he really is a, a, a patriot, a lover of God and true parents. Amen. And we're really blessed and honored to have him today. Let's, so would you welcome with me, Dr. Michael Nixon. Koreans must emerge 
who love North Korea more than their country. Also, North Koreans must emerge who love South Korea more than their country. The movement for the unification of North and South Korea begins with both sides have such a heart toward each other. I truly want to live with them. I do not want to die unless with them. I do not want to live unless with them. Unless with them. That's what true love is, okay? So that's the philosophy of North-South unification. What about world unification? Oops. So for true parents, uh, the significance of Korean unification goes well beyond Korea. First, uh, it'll be the final act bringing the global Cold War to a conclusion and a blueprint for the unification of the world. We can resolve the North-South problem in Korea. That could be a blueprint for resolving and reconciling other problems. And secondly, Father has always preached that Korea is in the position to provide a platform for the oceanic civilization and the continental civilizations to fuse together into a new global civilization. So that's the significance on the global level of the Koreas uniting. Okay, so in a nutshell, this is True Parents philosophy of unification, north-south and globally. So, can we find evidence that will back up uh, True Parents' basic position? Uh, the promise of a unified Korea as a driver of global development. What kind of world leadership potential does Korea have? And I want to look at this in five areas. Uh, that would be economy, uh, technology and technological innovation, transportation infrastructure, culture, and politics. So I'm going to run through each of these in terms of what is Korea's world leadership potential. The most, uh, start with the economy, and the most optimistic appraisal of Korea's economic future as a unified nation, that is North and South together, was a 2009 global economics paper published by Goldman Sachs. Have you heard of Goldman Sachs? It's a New York international multi-level bank. And so they're very particular about where they put their money. And this was a study that they, these are the conclusions of Goldman Sachs. So it carries some weight. Um, and their study assumed a peaceful and gradual economic integration between North and South rather than a German-style reunification. You know, in Germany, the wall came down, the two were shoved together immediately. That's not the assumption here, but they assume more of a gradual integration. And they emphasize the synergies, that is, the mutually reinforcing qualities of South Korea capital and technology, that's what they bring to the table. North Korea brings natural resources and labor, okay? So thinking about North Korea, North Korea actually has abundant mineral resources. Um, they have large deposits of minerals valued at 140 times their GDP gross domestic product, while South Korea has virtually no mineral resources. And they import about 97% of their energy and mineral resources that they use. Wow. So North Korea, rich mineral resources. South Korea, no mineral resources. That sounds like a good coming together. Most of the six strategic metals for South Korea minerals, coal, uranium, iron, copper, steel, and nickel, are all abundant in North Korea. So that's a synergy. They see that as a synergy. On the other, uh, at the same time, North Korea has rich human capital. Uh, the study refers to their abundant and competitive labor force. More than one third of North Korea's population, 37%, lives in rural areas. So this is about the same percentage that lived in rural areas at the very point that South Korea was ready to take off in terms of its great economic growth in the 1970s, about the same percentage. Uh, also, the labor force in North Korea could increase substantially because they have a huge military, right? Uh, about 1.3 million or 16% of the males between 15 and 64 are in the military. 
So if that military isn't necessary anymore, then that those numbers come into the labor force. Uh, Pre-college education is compulsory, so relatively educated. And I don't know if you know the Kaesong Industrial Complex. It's north of the border. It's a joint enterprise of the South and the North. The experience at Kaesong uh, suggests that North Korean workers have a strong work ethic and good potential for productivity. And also, finally, North Korea's population is growing roughly twice as fast as the South. So these are, refers to North Korea's rich human capital. The conclusion of Goldman Sachs' study is this. They say a united Korea could overtake France, Germany, and possibly Japan in 30 to 40 years in terms of their GDP, gross domestic product, should the growth potential of North Korea be realized. This would put the size of a united Korea in 2050 firmly on a par with or in excess of that of most of the G7 countries except for the United States. So in economic terms, a unified Korea going forward 30 to 40 years will be a major force in the global economy. Okay, so that's number one, economy. Number two, technology and technological innovation. So South Korea is already a leader in a world leader in technology and technological innovation. In 2017, it had the fastest average internet connection speed in the world. It, ranked as one, it ranks as one of the world's most wired countries with virtually every household uh, having broadband access. In 2010, the number of mobile phones operated in South Korea exceeded the population. That means they have a 100% penetration rate on mobile phones. And South Korea has been the top rated country in the Bloomberg Innovation Index for the past five years. So already South Korea is a global leader. As a global leader, uh, the, South Korea is beginning to focus its technology on social needs, not just economic potential. One model project that's consistent with True Parents' concern for the environment is the International Business District in Songdo City. And uh, so this, this uh, International Business District is trying to eliminate the need for cars, prioritizing green space, clean air, and efficient management of resources. All right. Every apartment building and business is located within 10 minutes of a bus or subway stop. And they even have pneumatic tubes that suck the trash out of apartment buildings and, uh, and uh, other places. So you don't need garbage trucks going around picking up garbage because you just put it in the tube and it sucks it away to wherever it goes. <laughs> and in this uh, Songdo City, greenhouse gas emissions are one third the amount of comparably sized cities. And this is an image of Songdo City. So you see the green space there, right in the center, uh, and so forth. OK, move to transportation infrastructure. Now, um, transportation infrastructure is very important. Uh, it's likely that the world's transportation infrastructure will shape geopolitics in the 21st century. And this is very consistent with true father's viewpoint. If in the peace-loving uh, peace global citizen, he wrote, when a road is built, it changes the course of history. The world can physically bound, be bound as one. The road will make it so. So father, that's why he advanced the International Peace Highway, right? So father sees the significance of transportation infrastructure for global integration and world peace. So um, one of the interesting things in the 20th century has been the tremendous acceleration of global transportation networks since the end of the Cold War. The most important development is the rebirth of a new Silk Road linking China to Central Asia and even Western Europe. So actually before the time of Jesus, there was an ancient Silk Road where merchants could travel from China to the Mediterranean as one of the proper, part of the preparation for the first advent. Now again, we're seeing a rebirth of a modern 
Silk Road extending from the east to the west. So building on this, China announced a Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI, in 2013. And this BRI includes a land-based Silk Road economic belt and an ocean-based maritime sea belt. I'm going to show you a map or two in a minute. This is one of the largest infrastructure investments in human history in covering more than 68 countries, including 65% of the world's population and 40% of the world's wealth. Wow. Mercy. This is a simple version, a simple uh, version of China's BRI, Belt and Road. The uh, orangey part is the overland route, the red is the sea route, but that's really a simplification. There's actually six uh, economic corridors extending from China into Central Asia, Europe, and East Africa. So you've got the North China-Mongolia economic corridor, uh, the North Eurasia land bridge, the Bangladesh, etc., etc. Um, this would be another vision of it. So you see the black, you see the black coming out of China are the Silk Road uh, initiatives and the blue is the water. So China in red is attempting to position itself as at the center of the world, as the center of Eurasia, basically. Everything comes in, into and out of China. Countries impacted by the BRI, you see this is the 65% Sixty-eight nations, sixty-five percent of the world's population, etc. But one thing you notice if you look at this map. Do you notice anything if you look at this map? Sure. One hemisphere. No, yeah. Korea. Who's missing? Korea. I don't see Korea. I don't see Japan as part of this initiative. Do you? No. They're absent. What is Korea's place? China's BRI, Transportation Infrastructure, does not include North Korea, South Korea, or Japan. But an integrate, a United Korea is an essential component of meaningful Eurasian integration. How can you integrate Eurasia without Japan, South Korea, North Korea? And South Korea's president, Moon Jae-in, recognizes this, the importance of these transportation links, and at the Inter-Korean Summit, the first summit he had with Kim Jong-un on April 27th last year, he handed uh, Kim Jong-un a thumb drive containing a new economic map of the Korean Peninsula. <laughs> and this map is based on a plan to modernize North Korea's antiquated railroads, and create an inter-Korea railway system. So this is sort of what it would look like. Um, it comes down both sides, the, the east side and the west side, and then it's kind of like an H, and then it crosses over in the middle. So integrating the two systems, then it can link up with the Trans-Siberian Railroad and the Chinese railroad systems. Northeast Asia is a dominant economic region. It represents a quarter of the world's G, uh, gross national product and is expected to be one of the leading economic blocks of the 21st century, along with the European Union and the North America. If you link up Korea and Japan, you'll establish the basis for a Beijing-Seoul-Tokyo transportation corridor linking six megacities. That means cities with more than 10 million population uh, when you link them up. Korea will link to Russia's Trans-Siberian Railroad and be an eastern extension of China's BRI rail system. So a fully linked Eurasian railroad system would look more like this. So you'd include, uh, you see it goes down through the Koreas and then across into Japan. So father's been pushing the Japan-Korea tunnel project, um, and Korea, the Koreas need to link up their railroad systems. Otherwise, Korea cannot fulfill its destiny, which is to link the ocean and the continent. How about in the area of culture? So we've covered economy, um, technology, and transportation. Now we go to culture. 
One of the remarkable developments of the 21st century has been the surge of popularity of Korean culture in the world. Have you heard of the Korean wave? Um, refers to massively popular Korean TV dramas, K-pop, and a variety of cultural products that are quite influential in China, Japan, Southeast Asia, but also India, the Middle East, Central Asia, around Israel, Turkey, Russia, even the Americas and Europe. So this is not trivial. It's an example of what, you know, political scientists call soft power. The influence that states can exert, exert simply by being well po uh, popular and well liked. So maybe you remember the size Gangnam Style a few years ago. It was the first YouTube video to reach one billion views. Even Obama and other people were referring to this, and people in America were doing the dance and uh, so forth. Also, these recent books have come out. The Birth of Korean School. How One Nation is Conquering the World Through Pop Culture. Another one, A Geek in Korea, Discovering Asia's New Kingdom of Cool. So this is in the area of culture where Korea is expanding its influence. Oops, wrong one. We expect this influence to continue. Korea has several advantages in the realm of culture. Number one, un it, unlike China or Japan, it has an advantage in Asia because it doesn't have a history of aggressive colonialism. Mm -hmm. Both China and Japan have histories of colonialism and aggressiveness. So there's suspicion about them, but Korea doesn't have that history. It also has an advantage in Middle Eastern and African cultures because Korea is still somewhat culturally conservative and so that enables Korea to explore family issues and changing values in ways that are acceptable to these traditional cultures, unlike the United States, where our, our cultural products are kind of unacceptable to traditional societies. But Korea's are not. And, and also, Korea's past history of, of Han, or shame, of foreign domination have helped it, uh, shape it as a super-achieving, super ambitious nation. <laughs> its determination to be the best of the best suggests that its cultural influence will continue to grow. Go to politics now. So while Korea has been divided, it's been a vortex of global confrontation. As a unified nation, Korea will be in a position to assert leadership. Currently, the great powers are at loggerheads. Who are the great powers? Primarily China and the United States. Russia is a, a, a little step behind. So China's Belt and Road Initiative that I was talking about is trying to draw the whole Eurasian continent into its sphere of influence. And then the United States started this Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, if you remember that. Uh, this is, what is TPP? It's an effort to contain China. Trans-Pacific Partnership. The US tried to ally with nations around the Pacific Rim and the East to try to contain China. But neither of these strategies seem to be working right now. The, B, the Belt and Road Initiative of China is encountering resistance, especially from India and some other countries that don't want to be part of it. And the United States, under, our, under Donald Trump, has withdrawn from TPP. The United States is not a part of TPP. So BRI is struggling, TPP is struggling. That's why Korea can become what's called a pivot state. A unified Korea will fit the profile of being a pivot state. What's a pivot state? It's a nation that is able to build profitable relationships with multiple major powers without becoming overly reliant on any one of them. So North Korea and South Korea come together. North Korea has relationships with China, historically, and Russia. Uh, South Korea has relationships with Japan and the United States. So Korea can be a hub. Opportunity to be a hub state of Asia, 
bridging the Eurasian continent and seas, fostering genuinely multilateral relations and prosperities. So, all of this depends on three things. To accomplish, three things have to be done. Number one, North and South Korea have to end their hostilities. They're still in a state of war from the Korean War. It's just a truce. It's not a, a peace. They have to end hostilities and they have to formally sign a peace treaty ending the Korean War, number one. Number two, they have to denuclearize de the peninsula. And number three, they have to develop a, some formula for eventual reunification. It doesn't have to be immediate, but it has to be some formula for reunification. I was told when I left Korea, that number one on that list was they had the goal to accomplish that this year. Hopefully. Well, uh, I think in the next three years, between 2018 and 2020, I think we'll see some significant developments. The Paman John Declaration, when uh, uh, Moon Jae-in and Kim Jong-un met for the first time in April, the interesting thing about that declaration, they affirmed each one of these principles. That declaration affirms each one of these principles. This is them signing that declaration. Uh, at the same time, we have to manage expectations. Uh, previous leaders have affirmed similar principles only to see commitments broken and promises unfulfilled. Maybe we in the central history have to fulfill our responsibility so the larger peripheral history can fulfill its responsibility. Amen. So people have gotten enthusiastic about it. Some have proposed constructing a DMZ peace park, for example, or having an Asian UN headquarters there, or a multinational city near the borders of Korea, Russia, and China as ways of dramatizing Korea as a model for resolving these intractable conflicts. These are good ideas, but they should not minimize the challenges that remain or the consequences of failure. That's why I want to turn to the second point. This is the consequences of not unifying, or what I call the perils of the two Koreas failing to unify. And in this area, I see four threats. The first uh, threat would be, these are South Korea's population crisis, economic uncertainty, isolation from global transportation networks, and the possibility of war. So just again to go through each of these, the South Korea population crisis. Did you know that South Korea has a population crisis? Yes. The fertility rate is miserable. The demographic situation in South Korea is dire. In 2017, uh, South Korea recorded its lowest fertility rate ever and has been the lowest fertility rate country for 16 years in a row. In 1980, there were 5.7 million students in elementary schools in South Korea. Today, there are 3 million, nearly half as many. That's why some of the universities are closing in Korea, because there's not students to populate them. According to Statistics Korea, the current population of 50 million will start to decline sometime between 2020 and 2030, and by 2060, it will have plummeted to somewhere between 34 and 44 million from 50 million today. By then, South Korea will be a country full of old people. Half the population will be over 60, and over a, only a fifth will be under 30. What are the solutions? Did you want to say? Maybe it's coming up. Yeah. Maybe it's coming up. Yeah. <laughs> There'll be time, but yeah, we can have some discussion after time this. Is for the next, okay? um, solutions. So other countries have low birth rates also. And what do they do? They usually look to immigration to supplement the native born who are not being born. All right, so they have uh, immigration. But South Korea is reluctant to admit foreigners. So this worsens the problem. Without meaningful immigration or reunification with the North, that's another solution, by the way, some say that this declining trend cannot be reversed. So if they don't unify, and if South Korea doesn't have immigration, this trend cannot be reversed. That's already gone too far. All right, the second issue is economic uncertainty. 
So South Korea rose from being one of the poorest countries in the world to a developed, high-income country in a single generation, right? Had some help from the U.S., but anyway. Nevertheless, the economy faces four problems. One of this is the economy is entirely built on an export. It's an export economy. In other words, they're exporting products and they're receiving money. 46% of the GDP of Korea is based on exports. Compared to only 13% of the U.S., even Japan, only 18% of their economy is based on exports. China, 22%. So, a very high percentage. Also, Chinese companies are starting to catch up to Korea in terms of their expertise, and they can produce the same products at a lower price. That's a threat. <coughs> a lack of diversity in their exports. Uh, Korea's exports are a somewhat narrow range of products. 45% of it is uh, uh, electronics, like Samsung and so forth. 21% are cars, boats, and parts. So when you're concentrated in a kind of narrow range of products, that means if the global market shifts, then, then it's, it's a problem, because you're not diversified. You're not protecting yourself that way. Um, information and computer technology will eventually reach a saturation point and then Korea has to find some other way. A third problem is lack of primary innovation. South Korea's competitive advantage, advantage has been making existing products more efficient and cheaper, more so than developing new products. So the emphasis has been on innovations that can be dealt quickly Bali Bali, rather than long-term reflection and fundamental research. And finally, pursuit of profit over people. Uh, in South Korea, they also have a trickle-down philosophy, like the U.S. some people have. The idea is that if the rich get rich, it'll trickle down to the poor. And so their policies have tended to support these large corporations, Hyundai, Song Song, and so forth. You know, they're called chaebols. But it hasn't trickled down. And so this has resulted in a wealth gap and unemployment, which is a problem. So these four, these are four problems in South Korea. What are the solutions? Number one, develop a more develop the domestic market. Uh, not everything exported. Domestic market and service economy in the South. South Korea, even though it's a, it's up there in the economy, it's number 17 out of 18 in terms of their service industry. That means internal services they provide. And Moon Jae-in, the current president, is pursuing a, pursuing a people-centered <coughs> economy focused on job creation, income-led, and service sector growth. So they're trying to address this issue of developing the domestic economy with people having more money in their pockets to spend. The second solution is to unify with the North. If they unify with the North, that will automatically diversify and expand the domestic market because they'll, they'll provide products for the North. It'll, and it'll, that will stimulate the economy in the South. Also, reunification will prevent the North from siding, uh, sliding into a semi-permanent tributary status with China. It's currently, and it's been for some time, like a tributary state to China. And it'll stay in that way unless something changes. Okay, so I covered uh, the, the, the economy and uh, what was the first one? Oh, it was population problem. Now, isolation from global transportation networks. The fact is, South Korea is not really a peninsula nation. It's almost like it's landlocked. It's landlocked by the north. It can't get through. Okay, South Korea remains landlocked by the north. North Korea prevents highways, trains, and other forms of ground transportation from passing through. South Korea is limited to air and sea options for trade. This adds a lot of expense, hinders regional development, and blocks meaningful Eurasian integration. If they fail to link up their transportation networks, this will perpetuate polarization and risk economic isolation for both Koreas. So this is an example. This is Russia. Russia has proposed a direct link to Japan um, 
forget Korea. If they're going to mess around and not unify, we're just going to come across and we're going to go right across to uh, right across to the Sakhalin Island. This is Russia. I mean, they might cross here. This their railroad comes to here. They might build their railroad up to here. It's easy to get across and pop down there across to Hokkaido, and then Korea is left out. In other words, Korea is no longer the gateway to Asia. It just comes. All the raw materials from Siberia and Russia can go straight to Japan. Japan products can go straight to uh, Russia and China, and Korea is left out. This would be an example of how the Trans-Siberian Railroad would then bypass Korea. So it would come across here from Europe, all the way across here, pop up to Sakhalin Island and down to Japan, and Korea is left out of the picture. So that's a threat. That's a threat. Also, China is proposing a, uh, a uh, tunnel, an undersea tunnel from China to South Korea, which would then bypass North Korea, and North Korea would, would be disadvantaged. So because of frustration, because there's no link up, these other bigger countries are thinking about other alternatives. Okay, and the last uh, uh, challenge is the possibility of a second Korean War. So, in fact, both sides have been conducting military exercises in preparation of war since 1953. That's why you do military exercises, right? To prepare for the eventuality of war. So North Korea has an estimated 8,000 big guns embedded in hardened artillery sites just north of the DMZ, 40 miles from Seoul, and 700,000 ground forces, and 2,000 tanks, and 300 aircraft, and over 40 surface warships, and about 50 submarines, all within 100 miles of the DMZ. On the other hand, South Korea has in place a Korean massive punishment and retaliation plan, which includes decapitation of top North Korean leadership. And the United States has some 330,000 military personnel stationed in Korea, 40,000 in Japan, including the U.S. 7th Fleet, which is the main Navy, and squadrons of long-range bombers from Guam. So they're all poised right there. And uh, that's a kind of a dangerous situation. What would be the cost of a Korean conflict? In a word, catastrophic. A war, a second Korean war would be catastrophic. Casualties in the larger Seoul metropolitan area alone may pass 100,000 in the first 48 hours. Even without the use of North Korean weapons of mass destruction, uh, and 200,000 to 300,000 South Korean and U.S. military casualties in the first 90 days. Wow. These are military figures, not mine. North Korea could hit the South Korean capital with an astonishing 10,000 rockets per minute. The use of chemical or biological agents, of which North Korea is estimated to have 2,500 uh, 2, to 5,000 metric tons of chemical weapons, <coughs> would drive the death and casualty total upwards exponentially, as would nuclear weapons. According to one analyst, a new war on the Korean Peninsula wouldn't be as bad as you think. It would be much, much worse. <laughs> That's just showing some artillery practice by the North. The outcomes of a second Korea War some analysts suggest the primary objective of a North Korean invasion would be to capture and hold Seoul for as long as possible. It's not far away from the north, right? 30, relatively close. This would be an important propaganda victory and involve the U.S., the South Korean army and the U.S. forces in a prolonged conflict because that would be an urban warfare. You got lots of citizens running around. It's hard to get through. You look at Syria, look at some of these other countries where you have everything's mixed up in these cities. It's horrible. You can't win a decisive victory that easily. You can't just drop a Moab bomb on it. That doesn't work. Also, China will likely intervene if there's a war. 
not to protect North Korea as a supposed ally, but to protect its own interests. So immediately, China will move to send troops in there to get control of the nuclear sites. They don't want the nuclear bombs going off and prevent their use. And they'll likely get there before the US forces do. And that'll be an awkward situation when US forces arrive and the Chinese are already there. That's not good. And if China does intervene, it will likely stabilize a post-war Korea on its own terms, not those of the United States or South Korea, and likely perpetuate further division. Okay, so those were some parallels. So I've tried to outline the uh, promise of a unified Korea, and then I tried to point out the perils if the two Koreas do not unify. Okay? Everybody doing okay with this yeah. academic yeah. lecture yeah. so far? Yeah. All right. Yeah. More, 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 more. Okay, let's do some more. Uh, okay, vision of a, of a heavenly Korea. This is more than a unified Korea. We're talking about a heavenly Korea. What will that look like? Well, I'm, I'm interested in the blessing ideal. How does that translate into public policy, right? So True Mother is the one that coined the term Heavenly Korea in referring to Korea's national destiny. And then it's Heavenly America, Heavenly Japan, Heavenly Africa. It started from Heavenly Korea. So what is True Mother's understanding of Heavenly Korea? I mean, we can have some discussion about that. But my understanding is she envisions a nation that accepts the unification, marriage, blessing, and family ideal. Countries that accept the unification, marriage, blessing, and family ideal. And this is to be signified by the nation's president conducting or overseeing a holy blessing ceremony and the multiplication of marriage blessings at the grassroots level by tribal messiahs. Does that sound warm? Yes. I think the Mother has said that explicitly. That's her vision. I think so. So, but the question then is, But how does the unification marriage blessing transform Korean national identity and public policy? How is that then translated into all these other areas of politics and, and so forth? And my answer is that it will do so by fostering, well, number one, multiculturalism. Korea, South Korea is basically a monocultural nation, right? Um, Korea will transform from a monocultural nation to a multicultural nation under a heavenly Korea. If you want a heavenly Korea, it will make that transition. And secondly, rather than being uh, patriotic for Korea, it'll be what Father called transnational patriotism. Patriotism of the Korea, Korean people will transcend their loyalty to Korea and encompass the world. Okay, so what will that look like? First, multiculturalism. So Korea's national consciousness, north and south, has tended to be insular. Historically, Korea closed itself off as a hermit kingdom, right? So isolated. The north preaches a national ideology of juche, or self-sufficiency. That's consistent with that consciousness. And the South is far more integrated with the world's economy, but it still retains a strong commitment to ethnic and cultural homogeneity. You, you need to have Korean blood, basically. Um, this has changed under the impact of South Korea's population crisis. I talked about the, the dire demographic situation there. The government is now supporting marriage migrants they're mostly Chinese and Southeast Asia women who marry Korean men. An estimated one-third of all children born in 2020 are expected to be part Korean and part other Asian descent. That's significant. One-third of all children born by the year 2020 are expected to be part Korean and part Asian. I think they have a Korean identity or something like that. In Korea? In Korea. In Korea. 
Some see South Korea changing from a mono-ethnic to a multi-ethnic nation. That, I didn't invent that. That's from an article I read. So this is consistent with unification thinking, I believe. True parents promote exchange marriage, do they not? Yeah. Aren't, isn't exchange marriage a marriage between people of different races, cultures, and nationalities, and especially from former enemy nations? Isn't that what exchange marriage is? Yeah. So if the unification marriage culture takes root in a marriage, in Korea one would expect to see this sort of thing. Also, don't true parents have the vision to set up international <laughs> villages and living arrangements in Korea? I think true mother is already at Chongqing set up a French area and other. American, Japanese. Yeah, sort of international village style culture. The, the Divine Principle says all the strands of world history meet on the Korean Peninsula. Doesn't that mean there should be no reason why Korea shouldn't welcome the world's people? If all the strands of world history meet on the Korean Peninsula, there's no reason why Korea shouldn't welcome the world's people. Stu and also studies show that growth and innovation occur in multicultural environments, not monocultural environments. A unified Korea embracing this ideal will help spark a new global renaissance. Okay, so that's what I'm talking about. This thing is needs to manifest a transformation of Korean national identity, multiculturalism. The, the issue of transnational patriotism, true parents call upon Korea to embrace transnational patriotism. So True Father said, if Korea is to be a nation the world welcomes, the Koreans must become a people who willingly take the lead by shouldering the cross of the world. Shouldering the cross of the world. Once unified as a nation, Korea will not seek to exploit the world. Rather, it will be a true nation, one that sacrifices for the world. Of course, America is supposed to do that too. And historically, America did that to some extent after World War II. True Mother said the same thing in her uh, 80,000 person Korea, Korea rally. She said, I will say this to the Korean people. We have received heaven's blessing. We must live lives in which we can share that blessing. What must we do for the global providence? The same kind of mindset. So as a divided nation, Korea had limited opportunities to exercise global leadership. Past policies that failed to achieve much due to continual breakdowns in the North-South relationship. And, and according to one commentator, this is like what you guys were saying this morning. There's already enough visions. There's already enough plans, roadmaps, and proposals. Enough talk. Right. What is needed is a breakthrough in the stalled inter-Korean relationship. Breakthrough. The question is, do we have the breakthrough people in place now? It is to be hoped that the current efforts of Moon Jae-in, Donald, uh, uh, Kim Jong-un, and Donald Trump will achieve that breakthrough. They're not paying attention to anything. They're just plowing ahead. Are they the breakthrough personalities that are needed at this time in history? At the time of the fall of communism, there was a elevated a bunch of people like Margaret Thatcher in England, and Reagan in the United States, Pope John Paul, uh, German Chancellor, um, what was it? Um, Kohl. Kohl. Helmut Kohl. They're all sort of on the same page. If that, if we have a breakthrough, then a unified Korea, hopefully a heavenly Korea, will emerge as a major new player on the world stage. The end. Wow. <laughs>
Yeah, that was, uh, I think, in addition to the, uh, the uh, communication and information technology, I said that uh, autos and boats, I said, which includes shipbuilding, is key for them. Yeah, what is the main cause of the population decline? Oh, good question. Kids the, main, the main cause of, of the fertility the decline in yeah. South Korea. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's a lot written on that. Part of it um, is the uh, workaholic culture they have in Korea. Um, the, the husband and wife have to work. They put in so many hours working uh, that they're concerned about having children, uh, the cost of living, the cost of education is very high. You wonder about that. Uh, the women want to pursue a career in Korea. Uh, the average age of marriage has risen to almost 30 before people want to get married. Um, well, I heard it's harder for them to marry also. Uh, because in Korea, or this, this is what I heard now, I don't know for sure, but uh, I heard that when the sisters, a lot of women are getting high, very high level degrees, and they don't. Oh yeah. Can't marry well. <laughs> yeah, it's not easy to marry a fellow that's under educated or something like that. So you can be a good old boy in Korea. Yeah, there's there's like five or six reasons that have been elaborated, and I don't have it in my head right now. It's not a medical problem. It's not a problem with people's fertility, it's a matter of choice. Yes. Pornography problem? Pardon? Pornography? Pornography? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, one, two, three, four. Yeah. Um, what role has our, are there any politicians that are in our church that are working in these peace talks or anything like that going on? Like, Directly, like, yeah. Directly in yeah, so what, what, where does the link between the central history and the peripheral history, where do they connect? And how do they connect? And uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I didn't research this, and I thought that's what they wanted me to do for this talk. They said, no, we don't want that. We want the macro stuff. We want the, the we don't want all that unification church stuff. So I didn't look into it carefully, but I know Father created a bunch of organizations. Of course, he met with Kim Il Sung, right? Uh, of course, Kim Jong Un has been sending gifts on true parents' birthdays. Um, we had created a, the um, what, what, the motor plant in North Korea. We have a peace uh, embassy there. We operate a hotel there. Um, Father had reached some agreements with Kim Il Sung about connecting families, about tourism. Women's um, Federation. The Women's Federation. One Percent oh, Love Share Project. Yeah, yeah we, that's right. Women's Federation has done a lot of good things in Korea as well. Um, the Little Angels, were, there was exchange of Little Angels and North Koreans. Um, so I'm not, I haven't looked at that systematically, but I think it's really impressive what our movement has done. Sort of like before the downfall of communism, our movement did so many things, and we don't really get credit for it. Mm -hmm. I think in the same way, uh, this reunification of Korea, our movement has done so many things, but it needs to be, somebody needs to be a, do a global study of that so we, it can be evident to people. But probably we won't get credit for it if they unify. It won't be us, it'll be Donald Trump will take credit for it. <laughs> within the providential will of God yeah. that this is happening. North Korea, as you know, was founded what year? What year was North Korea founded as a nation? 48. 1948. 
What year is today? 2018. How many years is that? How many years did the Soviet Union exist before it started to go down? 1970, in 1987, then within three years it was no more. So North Korea, the 70 year pattern in providential history is interesting. The children of Israel were uh, were in exile in Babylon for how many years? 70 years. How many years was the papacy in Avignon, France? 70 years. How many years did the Soviet people suffer under communism? 70 years. How many, year, how many years have the North Korean people suffered under communism in North Korea? 70 years. So I think there's a flow of history that it's reached the end of the suffering for the North Korean people and let my people go and the, they will start to emerge. One thing I didn't mention in this presentation, there's so many uh, unofficial and official markets in North Korea now where they're actually selling products. And uh, even on the collective farms, they get to market their produce. So uh, North Korea is kind of acknowledging that the system can't provide for its people adequately. So I think in the next three years, 70 years is kind of a limit point. And from uh, now through 2020, I think we can expect to see amazing changes. Got a question here. Yeah, but I acknowledge some other people. Right. These two, and then. So while well, father was alive, and father was looking at the Chinese situation, the limit to one child, the limit to a male child, and the Chinese going to just male children, he predicted back then that China would have to open up and accept brides from other countries to if they were going to invigorate their population. How's the Chinese population growth? How's their fertility rate? Well, I mean, they have, I mean, 1.2 billion people. So <laughs> they can go ahead with a one-child policy without it impacting them they, they very they dramatically. Change. They've eliminated that yeah. now? Yeah. Oh, I know they've eliminated it, but I just thought it created a, a huge wave of single men, I mean, of men that can't find uh, oh. brides. Right, so in China they can find brides, but they were only allowed to have one child. No, they can't find brides because there's so many men, but not that they can't find Chinese. In China? Yeah, because yeah. they yeah. Yeah. I, I read one article. Well, that's right, because, yeah, they want a, they want a male uh, son, so the daughters would be aborted and be an overpopulation of males. Yeah, I heard the estimate is 30 million more men than women. Yeah, so. Okay, Did, there's another one right here. Yeah, there, there, and there. I feel that a very, uh, the, our Korean situation comes to a very key point. And uh, <coughs> I think that when two fathers visit North Korea, uh, there was a treaty uh, between Unification Church, two fathers, and Kim Il sung I think uh, about six or seven counts. And uh, you already mentioned about the hotels and about those business. And I, I want to know, uh, right now, uh, after like, uh, right now, third generation, uh, right, uh, Kim Jong-un, then uh, uh, after some what, uh, of course, you know, they sent a missionary uh, uh, from North Korea to uh, Unification Church. But uh, about those business, uh, I just want to know what's going on right now and uh, how from now on Unification Church can, you know, uh, can get into those central uh, part of the, those uh, providential model. So that's the first question. And the second one is, uh, uh, I'm interested in the Moon Gen In, that Moon Clan was already uh, restored by to uh, messiahship was restored by Reverend Moon uh, to Father. So if you know <laughs> what position he is and how related uh, the po his, uh, uh, those Korean heads, those, uh, how? Clans? Uh, yeah, clans, uh, clans uh, <laughs> map or something. So uh, if you know the, those kind of uh, the messiahship position between relation with uh, Kim Jong, uh, uh, no, no, Moon Jae In and uh, True Father. The last time I think uh, I heard a true mother visited uh, uh, Koje Island, 
And uh, he was born in Koje Island at the Moon Jen Inn. So I heard a mother visited there uh, before go to. Uh, You're yes. saying yes. Your mother met him, or she visited the place no, where I he heard just from? visited there, uh -huh. but very that area is related to the uh, <laughs> Korean history. Okay. So if you know. <laughs> I just, uh, well, you're giving me good speaking. research topics there. <laughs> <laughs> no, do you know, Reverend Du, do you know if there's any link at all between Moon Jae-in and, and the Moon Clan or Father? Uh, there's no really connection, but however, Katsun Moon Yeah, Katsun Moon Shi Go, Abunimi Jongjang is an ayo. Ku Jongjang boy me, Moon Jae-in, Jiga Hangan Chansa, and then Mona Ben Ku Puyin Kim Jong Sung is an Hangan Chansa. Actually, yeah, it's the same thing. Uh, so, once father was uh, organizing the Moon Clan uh, meeting, uh, the Moon Jae-in, before he becomes a uh, president, actually their family was attending that uh, meeting, gathering. Yeah, any of the, those are uh, politicians, so they don't want to involve with uh, yeah. this religious. You know, uh, as you know that uh, our Egyptian church was a very uh, how can I say, Korea, once someone's related with the uh, Unicorn Church, they, are, you know, they got attacked from the Christianity, right? Yeah. So they don't want to really involve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I believe he I comes from uh, Hyeongnam area, the Moon Jae-in's family. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other question was more about the links between our movement and uh, businesses and such in North Korea. You know, mother gave the direction to uh, to discontinue the, the auto plant and early on after father's passing and, and <coughs> donate, donate our share to the North Korean government, which we did, uh, which I think was a goodwill gesture. And I think, uh, who, who's, who's running that auto plant, Reverend Pak? Uh, yeah, yeah. Before the Mr. Park was run, the older North Korea uh, business looks like uh, it's no longer run outside. Uh, so I think the last time, if we continue to run that, probably we got a lot of cues from the uh, Korean people. Because it has been that not long ago, North Korea, they you know, make a nuclear and they trapped it and threatened uh, you know, America, right? That time's. Uh, Previous time, one brother, church elder, was uh, related to North Korea. They got all second hand from the Russia, like a submarine, and then they sold to North Korea. So based on that, uh, North Korea was developed in summary. So we got a lot of accusations from the uh, South Korean people and the media. So if we kept that uh, uh, all the uh, factory, probably we got uh, more accusations. So I think the two fathers in the position is always just giving and giving and giving, not taking. So that is, I think, a good example. Yeah. But uh, probably we are not running anything from those people. Yeah. But the relationships are still there, and uh, the person who is running the plan is, goes back and forth all the time. Right. And also, Reverend uh, doc, Dr. Ju from the Washington Times has important connections there as well. Now, I'm not totally up on that. Thank you. Yeah. It's a trust factor. You it's know, all about relationships. It really think. is. And, and we have we have a really <coughs> high degree of trust there. You know, we invested a lot of money and then we just left it. We gave it back to the people. We didn't <coughs> we, we keep our commitments there. We've been very <coughs> hungry for ages because of the women's federation and many other things. And we've been giving rise to there are other sanctions and so forth, but we're always giving. And so there's a lot of trust, there's a lot of trust there. And, uh, and, and you know, it's interesting also that there's three, you know, there's uh, Kim Jong-un, his father, and then Kim, Kim Il-sung. All three of those, those relationships with us have, been, have traveled through all three of them, these men. They've actually transferred that trust factor from grandfather to father to son, as which is really remarkable. Amazing, actually. And uh, you know, he, Kim Jong Un was the only one, from my understanding, the only national uh, leader that sent a delegation from their nation officially to fathers. You know, someone. 
I mean, nobody else did that. I didn't have any faith that that high level kind of people coming from any other country. We might have had a few people coming from America that were, you know, it's totally different. This was official visit. Yeah, actually, I went twice in Korea. I mean, I went to three times in North Korea. And then, uh, the first time, uh, Kim Jong is uh, Kim Jong is a hero. We went to the North Korea, and uh, third time, when her father passed away, that uh, the North Korea government they they cannot come to the South Korea for the respecting our true father so on. That's why, because of the politician reason, that's why they prepare for the yeah. summer area in uh, Pyongyang, so they invite us to host it. So that's why that AG2 and you know, our group went to the North Korea. So that was the, our relationship with North Korea and you know, the Christian Church. So they officially prepared for the two other Somali section in North Korea. So the AG2 was uh, hosting the two other Somali. Yeah. I've been always a bit concerned that um, the true mother's sons who are estranged from her you know, uh, might try to take advantage of the situation and make inroads with North Korea in order to, say, pioneer the way sooner than the rest of our church can uh, and, and basically get a driver's seat with the relationship with the North. And I'm wondering if you're aware of there's anything like that happening. Well, I don't think we should be worried about that. If they are able to do something good, I don't think it's a bad thing. Uh, I think Preston H H1, so-called, he's actually H3 if you think about it. Hyojin is H1, Hunjin is H2, this is H3. Um, he wrote a book, Korea Dream. I don't know whether you know that book. It's a uh, his vision of Korea unifying and his organization has tried to do some conferences and things, and I think that's fine. Um, uh, he's doing it with our money anyway, so. Uh, um, yeah, um, I don't think that uh, Sanctuary has any interest in this matter whatsoever. Uh, the Family Peace or Global Peace group seems to have some interest, but they're no, by no means uh, as deeply invested as as the Family Federation for a Heavenly Korea, not even close. Mm. I was wondering, between the Korean people, North and South, did they agree to want to unite politically? Because what, what is happening is when you read about Korea, there are fights between the two, there are more frustration between the two, they want to fight and say, yeah, so the question is, is there a will among the Korean people to unite? And uh, because there's the Korean War. Um, I get the impression that in the South there's some hesitancy because of economic reasons primarily that uh, would be the primary resistance to unifying. Because it is a kind of a unified culture, same language, same kind of mentality in many ways. I don't know, I'm not the authority on this. Again, Reverend Duke, maybe you can say more. Yeah, uh, it's about, uh, you know, we are very uh, stick with our blood limit. So still many people, they miss their, you know, relating North Korea and South Korea. So still they have a lot of sympathy between North and South Korea. So the people, uh, we want to unify, but only political reason you know, still we have this barrier. I went to the North Korea, I see the North Korean people, I mean, I don't really feel I came to any country. <laughs> I don't feel anything. I was very comfortably, uh, you know, talking with other people. You know, anyone who went to North Korea, they kind of express the same way. So between North Korean people and South Korean people, you know, we don't have any barrier but only the political reason. Mm -hmm. The political reason is not only North and South. It's a, you know, between America and Japan and South Korea, mm -hmm. and Russia and China and North Korea. It's, it's kind of huge things. Mm -hmm. And then one more thing I'm trying to edit. 
uh, the last time that Dr. Nikola gave us some the same lecture to the uh, subreason 5, mm -hmm. I hear from that Dr. Nikola mentioned about that, about the uh, uh, elections, right? Mm -hmm. And then this time he didn't say that. Mm -hmm. But, oh, yeah. yeah. And then when I was impressed, I would, right after I graduated college, and True Father made it evening school in Korea. This was a 1990. Evening school, what Father said that, soon we have to prepare for the election from North and South Korea. So then, uh, you know, we have a lot of poor people in South Korea. So then once we have an election between North and South Korea, then lower people, poor people, they will vote to North Korea. So then once they said that what you are guys doing for the poor people, then we cannot say anything. Mm -hmm. So that's why your father was preparing that, you know. Mm -hmm. We have to think about this one. Mm -hmm. It's coming soon, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's why your father organized on the people of the day. <coughs> we made uh, so many uh, evening school, mm -hmm. night school. Mm -hmm. So college, college students, we are volunteer teach, uh, you know, school I and mean, students, mm -hmm. those who don't have money. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. under uh, professors. Mm -hmm. So that was father's vision. So mm -hmm. I was very amazed to hear Dr. Nicola mention about that point. Mm -hmm. So it's time, sooner or later, probably once we, our relationship the course, mm -hmm. probably we might have election between North and South Korea. Mm -hmm. So it, it amazing, right? Yeah. So father's like a uh, appreciation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or you could have a situation like Hong Kong and China, where you have uh, yeah. one nation, two systems. Mm -hmm. and, but the trade is opened up, the transportation is opened up. The division was mainly ideological, um, not cultural. Mm -hmm. And uh, culturally, kind of one, but ideologically, two. Mm -hmm. Like the North looks at the South as capitalistic um, puppets of America or something like that. I think that's dying away because of the. The, the, the disenchantment with Marxist-Leninism as a system. So I think that the cultural is stronger, so it will eventually bring them together. Okay, a couple more. Two more, then we'll go on to something else. I had a question about China's influence on the situation, because they're, I mean, North Korea is kind of their client state. Yeah. And are they going to oppose? or support uh, I think the general consensus is that China is not happy with North Korea, particularly the erratic behavior and possession of nuclear weapons they don't like. On the other hand, they don't like the idea of America or North Korea being uh, absorbed by the South and the having a country allied to the West right on their doorstep. So China is kind of conflicted about North Korea, I would say. Um, they wouldn't mind the status quo of a divided Korea so long as their leadership of North Korea is not erratic and unpredictable. Um, but I think that maybe if they had a bigger vision, they could see that the unity of the two would bring more prosperity and trade across from, then you'd have a switch from Japan through Korea into China and back the other way, it would be, it would be good for everyone. So I think they should think that way, but probably they'd like the status quo uh, as long as they don't have to cope with uncertainty about war. Oh, I just wanted to point out something that uh, my husband pointed out to me, which uh, he's not a longtime member. And so one of the reasons that he believes in True Father, it, one of the big reasons is because he sees where True Father came from in this little, you know, tiny town in Korea, dirt poor, basically, and, and how his vision transcended the nationalism and the tribal concepts of Korea and how he uh, forgave his enemy. In other words, the actual history of Korea gives no reason for someone like Sun Myung Moon to have the concepts and the teachings and the heart that he has. So it proves to my husband, that's one strong piece of evidence, and I never even thought about it because I just never saw it from his perspective, but that, you know, that the 
this person arose from such a small insular culture and went on to Japan first, in one sense, to reach out. The ultimate enemy of Korea at that time. You know, so that's evidence that there's something at work there that's way beyond this world, you know. Evidence of God. Evidence of God. Involvement in Father directly that he could transcend yeah. mm -hmm. whatever limitations there might have been. Um, I don't know how much, where our time is, but I just wanted to share something from our Institute of History that we started. So um, I was asked to be director of the Sung Hak, which is two parents, first name Sun Ha Moon and Hak Jahan. Sun Hak Institute of History. Um, I think there's only a, a, one other Sung Hak organization, which is the Peace Prize, the Sung Hak Peace Prize. But then we have the Sung Hak Institute of History. So um, we are tasked with preserving our movement's history uh, in America, particularly for our group. And um, actually, this is too big. Um, can we reduce the size um, of this? There should be four boxes going across. have a archive. We want to create a national archives, right, to preserve documents and all sorts of things, but we don't have that right now, so we're creating a virtual archive, an online archive, and so this is our current, um, yeah. This is our current, uh, um, structure or architecture for it. So, Yeah. 